Hey, Dr. Goodyear here, a live webinar, a little bit of a different event. Uh, we are down in south of the border, and I have with me somebody that I think you're going to want to hear. And so if you're not, you don't get a chance to join us, uh, you'll get a chance to check this out on YouTube. And it, it's, not, it's not her dog, Moji. <laughs> it's, uh, it's Dr. Nasha Winters. Dr. Nasha Winters, or Nasha, it's so good to have you here. Well, actually... I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, we're here together. That's right. Actually. That's right. I love it. And so, so we're actually in her living room, yeah. and uh, I thought it would be great to just kind of uh, bring her into the live webinar stream and just ask some questions. We've had some questions that have been submitted beforehand, just a whole slew of them. Thank you mm. for sending those on. But I thought it would be really good to start off with something that's a little bit more uh, current events, because I want to kind of give an intro uh, to Dr. Nasha Winters. And by the way, I'm down here because we're going to be recording some podcasts with her. She has an incredible story to tell. It's not just a story of her experience, but it's a story of what she's doing with it. And I think that's one that more patients need to hear, but honestly, more doctors need to hear because that's how this movement helps more patients. Mm. And, you know, you made a pivot from your practice because you you actually don't see patients. Correct. Why did you do that? <laughs> you know, it's 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 wild. I, I made the pivot to leave practice because I was getting to the point where that one to one process was not enough. Yeah. And and to have literally there was a point in my practice where I was eighteen months out on a wait list. And it became really, really painful for me to. L yeah. <laughs> we got a little sound. Oh, we're really we got, raw where we, we are. We got, we, got, we got great audio. We got good. You we're can't good. Hear okay, the good. Motorbike. You guys don't hear the motorcycle going by. <laughs> um, I don't know. They're just joining us. Um, That's right. But it got really painful for me to watch, watch people literally dying in the waiting room. Like they just, I couldn't get to them fast enough. And I knew I had tools and information that might be able to offer something different or offer something more. And that point in time was when I stepped out of private practice and moved more into consulting. And initially I thought, well, I'll just go out and sort of train patients uh, to be consultants, to train patients to be advocates for themselves and others. And so I put my energy there for a while, very successfully, an amazing group of of uh, advocates came out of that first iteration, that sort of beta iteration. I think about 50 uh, at the end. There were 10 really kind of hardcore ones that were ready to see patients, and um, the other were doing it more for self care and kind of being my test run with it all. But even in that group, what happened, and this I don't mean any disrespect for any physicians listening in here, no. but the patients became savvier than the doctors. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. And suddenly I realized I've trained all these amazing advocates, which is information I've learned to, to support myself all these years and then bring the things I'd learned in decades of practice and study and realized we didn't have any place for these, these patients to go right. to get the labs ordered, to get the imaging ordered, to get the right you know, testing and evaluation. My dog feels the passion. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, that's... <laughs> um, and she's so standing up at attention she is, because she's like, she agrees. She, this is, you got to listen to this lady. <laughs> And so what ended up happening is I realized I had to switch back to just uh, sort of educating and empowering the patient to doing the same for the clinician. Yeah. And that uh, just kind of evolved. And suddenly I had 12 doctors that I'd worked with for years that had, uh, I'd been consulting with them on their patients for a long time. And I went to them and said, you guys have been working with me a long time. You have the outcomes. You see the differences. And we're talking MDs, NDs, conventional oncologists, a, a PA, I'm pretty sure that was our mix at the time at that first 12. And basically I said, I'm going to teach you how to fish. I'm going to stop giving you fish because mm. I need help to help these patients that are literally dying in the waiting room oh, wow. when we're getting hundreds of inquiries a month for who is trained in this method and they didn't exist. And within, in, within six months, those 12 doctors were already a year out in bookings for patients waiting when to see this? them. This was in 2020. Oh, wow. Yeah. And luckily or unluckily, I suppose it were, that was at the time when all these doctors were like, I'm not gonna leave private practice, I'm not gonna leave brick and mortar. Yeah. I'm, you know, I still wanna do my thing and I'll do this a little bit on the side and then COVID happened. <laughs> come here, Moji, come on, oh, come okay. down. This is, this is raw, by the way, she if you is, can She's tell, feeling so. the passion. And, and so in that time, 
COVID happened and mm -hmm. everyone's lives and, and practices went virtual. And so yeah. suddenly I have this group of 12 doctors who their lives changed forever. And this program and what they learned changed forever. And the patients they started to support changed forever. And suddenly it was supposed to be 12 people that were supposed to help me is now 200 people wow. at the time of this live discussion in 36 countries and 300 advocates in 36 countries that are out there and we still can't meet the demand. So that, that's, I mean, that's the scary part. Yeah. But what you've done is you, you provided a different strategy and approach to exponentiate yourself, so to speak, yeah. if that's even a word. Um, <laughs> it is now. <laughs> but yes, yeah, right, it is now. So we'll have to look up a, a Cambridge or an online exactly. dictionary and, and put it in there. Fact checker. That's right. That's right. It doesn't exist. That's right. That's right. There they go. There, there's the naturopathic yeah, doctor going again. Lady. Yeah, crazy lady. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you found a way mm -hmm. to say, I can have a bigger impact yeah. by training up, elevating up, doctors because if you take mm -hmm. care and you heal 30 patients with cancer then if you that's that's incredible yeah. but if you then do the same for 30 doctors yeah. now you have something yeah and that and that's what you've done yeah. so was it something you just kind of fell into <laughs> yes. like out of necessity everything's like well it seems good i'll get my colleagues to help me out with this and then suddenly it just turned into a whole thing the first the first cohort led to a second cohort and at that second co cohort I realized I was so in over my head and then slowly but surely we accumulated a team to create this a whole entire education and this education is through a nonprofit organization that Perfect. goes back in any profits after um, covering overhead and expenses goes back into patient grants yeah. to help patients get access to therapies yeah. like this to other clinicians in other parts of the world or new graduates, for instance, that may not have the funds or the resources to pay for a program like yeah. this. And we created a global pricing so that if you live in Zimbabwe, for instance, and you wanna take this course, you're, the pricing will match what is equivalent from the US pricing to, oh, your, wow. own, to your own currency. Yeah. And so we have, I mean, it's evolved. We're now in our eighth cohort, getting ready to start our ninth. Oh, wow. This has all just started since January, 2020. And prior to that, I left private practice in 2015. I worked with training the advocates, and by 2018, I, I had to restructure that. Four years from 2009 until 2016, my, my husband and my sister-in-law and I ran retreats. That's how we could onboard larger groups of patients. So that's kind of how you really molded it there exactly. initially. Exactly. That's how we really curated the information. Right. And it was from those retreats that everyone was like, Nisha, this is like drinking water out of a fire hydrant, which I'm always accused of doing, is offering too much information. But, you know, that's, that's interesting because I told you last night, yeah. which, by the way, her husband is an incredible chef. I told him we're going to submit a five-star review <laughs> for their Airbnb, which their house. They've opened their house to us as guests, which is incredible. Um, I told her she's a southern lady. <laughs> At least she, she has all of that from her hospitality, mm -hmm. but then he's also a five-star chef. So, But we were talking last night, and I was telling her about one of the questions we got from somebody on social media, oh, yeah. and they were you know, talking about naturopathic physicians, not in the positive light. And I, I made a comment very quickly that some of the smartest doctors I know are naturopathic physicians, mm -hmm. and I, I mentioned you and Paul Anderson, of yes, course. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Just brilliant, brilliant doctors. Oh, and so I remember... so. By the way, this is live, so if you want to you know, drop yeah. some questions, please just, just drop them. We got some questions from uh, emails sent out before. Also, s drop some questions, and if we need to, we can answer those on a podcast or, or do those at a later, later time. Cool. But, um, you know, I, I, and I totally forgot about where we were going with that, but that's the great thing about being live. Oh, so, um, you know, when you, when you look at cancer, taking this to a current yeah. event thing. Yeah. There was that, that quote that I wanted oh. to bring in. Let me see if it'll get my face here. Mm. Was cancer is striking more young people and doctors are alarmed and baffled. <laughs> so, you know, that was, I think that was published last week. Yeah. That, that article that was talking about how doctors were really baffled and, and alarmed. <laughs> um, now you've been doing this a little bit longer than I have. Um, I'm actually older than you. Um, huh? Yeah, so I thought I was the elder. I, no in this names, room. no names will be, no numbers will be mentioned <laughs> here, except mine. I'm 53. 
She's a lot Barely, younger than a me. Fair, yeah, a lot, a a lot younger than me. Weeks no. younger. <laughs> years. So, so I, I'm just going to get myself in a whole lot of trouble with my wife. I have no <laughs> problem sharing my age. I'm good. I'm 52, folks, because I get to celebrate 52 years. I get to celebrate waking up and seeing the next sunrise, the next life, because 32 years ago, that wasn't going to be the case. You know, and we'll talk about that in the po- podcast in Teasers. detail yeah. because you, you you act like you've done this before. Uh, a little bit. Yeah, professional. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, what's interesting about this quote, and when I went and listened to you at the Mistletoe Conference in 2021 in yeah, Denver, gosh. Um, I had heard of you. I heard of your, I've heard of your book. I, I read more studies than I do books, uh, but I have read the majority of your book. Yeah. And because I wanted to do that in preparation for this. And also, it gives me um, the ability to tap into your mind. Yeah. And, and how <laughs> you look at things. Yeah. But when I heard you speak, and there were a lot of great doctors there, mm-hmm. MDs. It was one of the more succinct, data-driven, you know, no, no crap um, <laughs> lectures I've ever heard and so that right there completely changed the way I was thinking about mistletoe oh cool I mean we were already doing mistletoe but what you did is you just completely changed the persona and perspective of it how you presented it you led with data has that been the way you've (laughs) always done it Always, always. I'm definitely a data-driven person. I mean, I, in my world, in the beginning, I was going to go to conventional medical school. That was my plan until cancer had another story for me, which we'll cover later. Yeah. Um, but because of uh, standard of care, though, yeah, 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 I was pre-med. That was the direction. I was biology, chemistry major. I was on my way to that. Cancer decided to change that course a little bit. And because I did not get um, help from the standard of care, not because they didn't want to, I was too far gone. I mean, I was sent home to die. I, ha- I was on my own. I was on my own. And I'm still on my own. I'm still like learning these things for myself and applying to myself and then applying to others and learning more and applying to myself and applying to others. And the story just re- plays on repeat on and on. But what I have always been as a scientist first, mm-hmm. a data-driven person first. And um, I tell people like I'm science heavy with a touch of woo instead of all woo and little science. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> So, um, because I, and the woo is that there's also so many mysteries of life. Yeah. You know, and there's things that we don't have answers for, or things that we thought we had answers for until something new came along. But that's science, is it not? Exactly. Science is Which constantly is, evolving. Exactly. And yeah. isn't that funny that we've lost sight of that? <laughs> hmm. I wonder why. I wonder, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we won't go down that yeah, road. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not yet, at least. That might be later. Yeah. But oh, you yeah. were you love were, to go down that rabbit hole with you sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Goodness. Well, you alluded to that quote that came out this week mm-hmm. about boy, doctors are baffled and like really scratching their heads over the, the 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 younger and younger people being diagnosed. Well, first of all, I want to know where these doctors have been for the last ten years. Oh, head in the sand, right? Because this isn't new. Yeah, I've been asking. I've been like shouting the alarm system for years. Like so, when I left medical school. The average age, based on World Health Organization statistics, uh, you know, all the statistics, was the average age of person with cancer was 68 years old. It was considered a disease of the aged. Yeah, yeah. That's how it was always. 20 some years later, the average age today is 48 years old. And even, I know. Blah, but, I, I love data and I love statistics. I've never heard that yeah, number. It's, and that's in, that's a generation. In a generation. Wow. And so to even give some context, there's a, an oncologist who's in our, who's come through our training in our cohort and the head of a major academic medical institution in the southeast part of the country who his specialty is gynecological oncology. And oh, yeah. he's never stepped into the realm of alternative or integrated medicine until he ended up seeing as a gynecological oncologist multiple patients under the age of 10 with stage four ovarian cancer. And that is how our paths crossed. Oh goodness gracious. That is how he said, I'm trying to retire, but I can't retire because I need to understand why this is happening. And that's how our paths crossed. And then he ended up, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid and joining into our, into our merry band. 
Um, but he he was like, we, we're not asking the right questions. We're mm -hmm. and so the fact that it's now people saying we're baffled now. How have you not been paying attention? Yeah. Because the there's been multiple studies over the past decade showing that the fastest rate of cancers are happening in people under the age of 40. Yeah. Um, colorectal cancer now over like the age of colorectal cancer used to be again an older yeah. generation. Same thing with glioblastoma. Oh yeah. All of them are under the age of 35, 40 years old. A resurgence of leukemias and lymphomas all in our pediatric population, and everyone's like. I, I don't understand how this is happening. Well, it isn't just overnight happening. It's no. been insidiously coming on more and more and more, and people miss it, right? People don't think about looking at the 30-year-old with these symptoms to think that they could have stage four cancer. So, and I'm kind of tying in some questions as, as I'm talking to Dr. Nasha. Mm -hmm. So if anybody has any questions, please uh, drop them there and I'll check them out. Um, but I, I, I went ahead and uh, another one came up that mm -hmm. I actually, we, we shot a reel of earlier uh, talking about glioblastomas, Oof. okay? The question was, are glioblastomas inherited? And so I thought it was a really good question um, because I actually talked to somebody the other day that said she has seen a grandmother, a mother, and a daughter all diagnosed with glioblastoma, and the only connection between them is their gut microbiome. Interesting, yeah. So they had the exact same um, overgrowth and deficiencies in their gut. Right. And so she was, as I was talking to her, she was, she was describing mm. a different type of inheritance than maybe yeah. what we think about. Exactly. So maybe I mean, it's what, not what on do you think genetic. about that? Well, I think it's really fascinating um, in that, you know, again, that concept of nature nurture. Yeah, yeah. So the nature being our genetics. Um, you know, there's, that's one component of which less than 5% of cancers are actually truly of genetic origin. And then there's the nurture, which is sort of like, what is the environment in which your genetics are playing in yeah. or interfacing with? Yeah. And so what we're starting to see is w when we hear these younger and younger people getting diagnosed with cancer, they immediately jump to got to be genetic. We'll go do a deep dive. We'll do the tissue assay or the blood biopsy and take a look. And they're assuming they're going to see a germline mutation or some other uh, genetic mutation to account for why it's such an aggressive cancer in such a young person. Right. And lo and behold, they're like, there's no, there's no gene here. But they, and then they just kind of put it away and just don't even, they should say stop there. They don't keep going, well, what else could it be? And so what's interesting to your point is when you see generations happening where there's not a genetic underpinning, but you see a lot of these patterns showing up or revealing themselves again and again, you have to look at the environment. You have to look at it. And so we're actually, your story right now, there actually is an interesting, for the first time in my career, I am seeing a family that has had an, a Lynch mutation based glioblastoma. Wow. I've never even, I didn't even know it was a thing until this young woman who's 19 um, came into my life a few months ago. Two years ago, she lost her sister who was also 19 to the same diagnosis. Again, fits in with the, that story from last week, younger yes. and younger and yeah. younger. And the region and the world that they live high, there, there's just like a lot of stress. There's a lot of toxicity. When we did her toxicology profile to look at, okay, what is the genetics? now? A, a Lynch mutation is very much a genetic. That's yes. one of those 5%. But it's also not one of those mutations that's set in stone. Right. It's one that you can overcome. Right. It's expression. But it's very vulnerable to the environment in which it shows up. And so it's a, it's a matter of how you, your body repairs your DNA. And this person doesn't have that ability to do that. So the more they're exposed to things that cause harm to the DNA, the less they're likely to clean it up. So you, you don't use the word environment hmm. in your book. Um, this is, by the way, this is the book, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer. So <laughs> I, I thought you wrote this, you know, because you are just 29. I thought yeah, you, again, I, I thought you wrote this just a few years ago and you actually did, but I actually thought you had written this a while ago, mm -hmm. but you actually published this in 2017. Yeah. We turned the manuscript in November of 2016 and it came out in May of 2017. And it was welcomed with open arms by the medical community, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But weird, here we are. 2017 feels like eons ago at this point, right? Yeah. But what's happened is, never promoted this book. Never, I mean, I wrote this book because I had patients saying, 
you're giving us so much information, please write a book. Mm. And it, you know, so I wrote it really thinking that my mother and a few patients would read this, that this would be like their manual. Um, first of all, my mom still hasn't read my book. And um, so, all, <laughs> dear, if you're listening, lady, you know what you've got to do now. Um, guilt, guilt, guilt. But, but the, the, the number of people, so now we're well over 100,000 copies sold in six languages, two more coming out. It's still one of the top sales of the Chelsea yeah. Green Publishing. It's still in the top 10, almost always in the cancer sections on Amazon in a variety of ways. It still gets so much accolades. I still can't believe I, I'll be on an airplane and I'll look over and someone's reading it. I mean, it freaks me out that it's out there. I never thought it would have that reach because all we're doing is sharing information about the terrain. That's the word. Yeah. That's the word. Which is the environment. Yeah of our body. It's the garden of inside of us and everything we're put in on around us, including our thoughts and the people we hang out with. Right. People don't take that into account of how Not that can all. have an impact on your epigenetic or genetic expression. Well, your husband, uh, Steve, was talking last night uh, as he was fixing us the absolute best guac Old school. In, in the world. Yep. It was incredible. In the but he, he was, we were talking about the blue zones. Yeah. And we were talking about what is really in the blue zones, what's not. And he, his take was that probably what connects them all was community. Yeah. Is community. And that's mm. kind of what you're talking about there with the epigenetics and, and how yeah. we live in the environment. But is that not a part of our terrain as well? It very much is. Well, it's funny, you know, it's something I've been talking about a lot in the last couple of years is my version of the CDC. <laughs> oh, I, since, I know. I haven't since, heard this I one. know. Well, so since the CDC is kind of in all of our mindset these days, right. I'm like, I'm going to take liberties with this and reconstruct it in a way that makes sense to me and the, and the people I serve. <laughs> and so that CDC stands for circadian rhythm, mm -hmm. diet, mm -hmm. and community. There you go. And when we, here comes the there other we visitor. Go. Welcome, yes. Mitra. Thank you. We have a question. <laughs> she here. just wanted like the community oh, part brought her in. Um, but that's the piece here is when we impact our, the, the, the rhythm of our, of our day to day, the rhythm of our life, when we, yeah, thank <laughs> she you. was getting well, a, that's, a, that's a bumble, she's that's trying a, to save you that's from a bee. bee. <laughs> no. You guys are seeing the wild, this is the wild uh, west of my life here. It's, um, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> it is. Whoa. But when, when folks, wow, it really likes you. Yeah, I guess All so. Right. Are you trying to protect him from uh, that? Then, there we go. No. <laughs> oh, well. You okay. guys are getting the unfiltered <laughs> version here. Okay. Um, but but when, this is what we've gotten so far from. And so we were talking about last night with the Blue Zone. Everyone's just sort of like hyper-focused on the diet. Right. That everyone must be a certain, eating a certain way. Well, you look at these cultures and these communities, they're all eating very, like they're eating real food close to the source food. Mm -hmm. But it's not really about, is it meat or not meat? Is it this? Is it not this? Is it alcohol? Is it not alcohol? Right. It's about how are they feeling when they're eating it? It's about who are they eating it with? Are they driving down the car, driving down the road, going through the drive through doing three things at the same time while they're shoving a CAFO farmed burger into their mouth? Yeah. Or are they sitting and deliberately, like we were last night, sitting around... That was no, community, bar, community, and it was it was it was a very simple meal with figs, with guac, with uh, radishes. Rad oh, yeah, th those radishes were incredible. I know the watermelon radishes is our chip. I mean, it was there was there was incredible. But then here's the question that kind of ties into the terrain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Another question is cancer. I, I like to debate people about the word disease. Mm. Is cancer a disease, or is it simply something else? Is it a mm. reaction? to a inhospitable environment yeah. or terrain. Well, what I think is really cool is we've spent the last hundred plus years looking at cancer as a somatic mutation theory, which is a genetic disease. Right. And yet we've shown that less than 5% of cancers are truly genetic. So why do we still keep beating to the rhythm of that drum when it's not panning out the way we've built an industry around it to That's... do so? There's that. There's, I think that's <laughs> there's your answer. And we could like drop the mic there and be that's done. Right, that's but, but, uh, right. Good night. <laughs> and good night. Um, but there's a couple of things. There's a cool a couple of thoughts around like Toft theory, adaptive theory of cancer around this 
idea of cancer as a wound healing yeah. process, cancer as an evolutionary repair system or protection. I want, to, I want to talk to you about that tomorrow because you know Fun. what I used to do was before I got into cancer was vagin, you know, uh, oh, yeah. prolapse. Yeah, and so I was involved with the vaginal mesh and. You know, and when you look at it from a cancer perspective, if you have a quote unquote wound that does not heal, yeah, falling in yeah. line with that theory, and then we put foreign bodies in Ooh. the midst of that, Ooh. that doesn't seem too smart. No. <laughs> Activate <laughs> problems big time. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but anyway, so yeah. I had a little bit, but because yeah. I think that's important because when you look at what a lot is done in conventional um, surgery today, they do do just that. Exactly. They exactly. They do just that. Yeah. Well, and this is what's, you know, back to your question of this is, when, you know, because people are like, well, what is cancer? That's such the, the big question. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we know what it isn't. It isn't an, uh, an event. You know, it's a process. That's right. And it's going to uh, land differently in your body or your body or your body or my body, the way it expresses, the way it accumulates, the way it, it shares its existence out there. And so what I've learned over 30 plus years of this journey for myself and directly in connection with tens of thousands of patients and now indirectly in connection with hundreds of thousands of patients is I look at cancer in a very different way now, which is as a messenger, as something that's showing us where we have an issue, you know, like kind of like shining the light on something and as a metabolic response to something in our environment. Sorry, and so those are the things that I, I'm learning or thinking are more, makes more sense than just saying it's a genetic disease. So that's what I would kind of put out there. And I know we're going to dive into deep levels of this and go down a lot of rabbit holes in the next few days together. Cause any one of these discussions can go for a full hour or more discussion. Yeah. So, you know, so if you want to take some deep dives with Dr. Nisha Winters and see how her mind works, how it ticks, on some of these deep dives, um, they're, they're gonna be worth your time. But what's gonna be more important than that, I think is the mm. story you tell. Mm. Because it's the story that you tell of how you reach this point that provides the credibility for what, for what you do. So here, here was a question actually was sent in by somebody beforehand. And I thought it tied very, very, very well to you. It said, if my tumor load is gone, mm. is it possible for my immune system to suppress further progression indefinitely? Oh, that's an interesting question. Because, now this patient specifically had non -small cell, has non-small cell lung cancer. Okay. Ovarian cancer. I've heard you say this mm -hmm. a few times. Mm -hmm. Is there still a solid area in you? In me personally? Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Yeah. So when this person, you might as well just ask it, flip it around. Right. If my tumor load is gone, mm -hmm. is it possible for my immune system to suppress further progression indefinitely? Insert stage four ovarian cancer. Yeah. yeah. Nasha winners. Yeah. Is, what's the answer to that question? Well, not just for myself, but for thousands of patients, I've had the privilege to work with directly and seen these quote unquote anecdotes yeah. <laughs> that are apparently not good enough data, despite real stories and people like Kelly Turner who share stories like this all the time of people with radical remissions. But I'm not even, I would not likely be considered someone in remission per the way standard of care Correct. qualifies it. I am living it with a manageable process. My body has kept, everything is in communication and holding things in a homeostatic place that is allowing me to thrive and the cancer not to thrive. Right. And we just kind of got this symbiotic understanding with each other. And if I'm not caring for my terrain the way I should be, it will let me know pretty quickly. And the same thing, like to your, to the point of the person saying, well, do I have to be like zero cancer to um, have a leg up or a, an opportunity to stay ahead of it? I, I've, I've said this a lot. We can go into this rabbit hole too, which is, I'm much more nervous about someone having certain markers of their terrain hmm. being elevated than I am about someone having something on imaging or a tumor marker. Wow, that's a good point because you know, we get lots of questions about imaging. Yeah. And when people see imaging, especially in the midst of treatment. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, how, how reliable, and so this is not yeah. one of the questions, but I think it's appropriate yeah. here. How reliable would you say one should be on imaging, yeah. especially in the midst of treatment? Because yeah. it creates a lot more worry than it does help. 
Agreed. And especially early on in treatment, say the first six weeks to, to three months of any new treatment. Yeah. Standard of care, Keep naturopathic care, mistletoe, yeah. immune therapies in particular. A lot of these things, what they do first is they create pseudo progressions. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't know what is a pseudo progression, meaning a response, a natural immune response to sort of the, the, the tumor blowing up, yeah. swelling up before it dies. False progression. Yeah. We then don't know, like, what's Lou? So people will think, oh my God, it's, I'm, it's worse. It's getting worse. The thing I'm doing isn't working. And yet when we put all of our attention on the physical image or on a number of the, yeah. like the tumor marker, those will, and there's even like therapies like Gemzar, for instance. Gemcetamine yeah. is one of those drugs that the doctors will tell the patients for the first 12 weeks, you might see worsening on your tumor markers. And this is precisely what's happening. You definitely see this in the immune therapy place, but really you see it everywhere. And so we are often looking too soon and making like assessments based on things that we can, we need to be looking at other metrics right. to really evaluate for what's truly going on. Is this pseudo progression? Is this a cytokine release? Is this tumor lysis? Is this true progression? And how do we know? Because if we just depend on the imaging and just the tumor marker, we may actually be mismanaging our patients. I would say in many ways we are. So assessment of the patient mm -hmm. obviously begins with listening, but there are more labs that yeah. I believe, and you know, you've talked about them ad nauseum about, they, they give us great perspective of mm -hmm. the environment. Yeah. And exactly. so those are the labs that can actually show us the changes before we start to see yes. the tumor markers. Because here's the analogy I, I often present to patients is that it's like, you know, and I hate to use this analogy because going to war on cancer is not the right approach. Mm -hmm. It never is. But let's just say we're using that example. And so the general comes and says, well, how's the bombing been going? Yeah. Well, I think it's been going well, but I don't know because all we see is the smoke rising from the battlefield. Mm, that's a now, great the problem analogy. here is the battlefield is the body. Yeah. And so in, in that, you can see the pseudo progression. Right. You can see that smoke. You know something's happening. Yep. You don't know to what extent, but you might get some insight with the terrain with the labs, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's not the tumor markers. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where we, have, we limit what we are. There's a, I can't remember the quote exactly, but basically we only see what we look for. Oh, wow, yeah. Right? And so if you're only looking at a tumor marker, or, or that which you don't look for. Well, that's exactly it. It's almost like, what are you not looking for? And so those are things that we are limiting ourselves in the standard of care. A, a lot of that is not the, of the choice of the doctor, but unfortunately a, me, a medical system, an insurance system mm -hmm. that limits what you're allowed to run. Right. Because the types of things I want to look at with a patient, there'll be a time when the insurance says, not the doctor, but the insurance says, nope, you can only run a C-reactive protein once a year. Yeah. And we're looking at it monthly during this process to actually tell if we're looking at an acute phase reaction or a chronic reaction, you know? Okay, so you brought it up. You have a, a little word, you call it a trifecta. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So in, again, this was not part of the questions, but if you had to pick three yeah. labs yeah. for anybody with cancer. Yeah. Or even been anybody without it to yeah. screen for. That's right. Early That's... diagnostics. What are those three tests? So C-reactive protein okay. is what we just started with, right. which is a, it's a protein that shows up in, in kind of general inflammatory conditions. Right. But it's also, if you go and do a PubMed study and you just say C-reactive protein in cancer, <laughs> how many hundreds, if not thousands of yeah. papers will you find? And when you start to look at it, it's in, by itself, without even its two friends that I'm going to talk about next, by itself, it's prognostic. So if you have an elevated C-reactive protein at the time of your diagnosis and treatment, your prognosis is worse. Your side effects are worse to whatever treatment you're bringing on board. Your progression-free survival is lower. Your overall survival is lower. And you have a higher incidence of multiple drug resistance. Does that seem like this might be an important lab to run in every single patient looking at a cancer diagnosis and starting treatment? See, I love what you said there because <laughs> you're using valid clinical endpoints yeah. to describe this. Yeah. That's why I said you're data-driven. Very, much. Very and, much. And and people do not look at the quote-unquote complementary, yeah. alternative, integrative, natural world as data-driven. Right. But what they'll do, doctors will say, um, you're, you're cured. 
<laughs> yeah, oh. That's not a cl valid clinical endpoint. No. But what you did is you just spoke statistical data right. in the proper scientific term. Right. A naturopathic physician. Yeah. Ooh, imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that is to elevate you. That's yeah. not to yeah, I know, yeah, I know, but, but right. you're right. I mean, because people, I think, assume, and usually when I sit on a call, I, I can't even tell you how many times I have doctors... Um, or patients who, because I don't work directly with patients anymore, as you alluded to earlier, but I do work with their doctors. So if you have, if you're a patient listening and you have a doctor who's somewhat curious or open-minded, willing to have a conversation and learn, um, I do consults with doctors on patients' behalf. Mm. And so part of it's like, again, teaching them how to fish, not giving them fish. Mm -hmm. And so preferably I work with people who, I mean, but I get, I get those doctors every once in a while who comes on just grumpy saying, I'm here because the patient paid for your time and my time. Let's get this over with. Yeah. I, if I had a dollar for every time that's happened, I would probably be a very wealthy woman. But what happens every single time, it, wow. without fail, at the end of that hour, every single time, without fail, they're like, that was amazing. When do we do this again? Can I do this for other, people, pe other of my patients? Can I do this for myself? Wow. Because they realize I'm literally exa doing exactly what you said. It's mm -hmm. And they always say, I'm really surprised with the data that you look at. I'm really impressed with the um, references that you utilize. I'm really impressed with just your life experience and the way you articulate it. They realize I, everything I'm saying and doing and asking questions about is backed by data. But see, that should give patients confidence. Right. When they want a natural approach, when they want a more integrative approach, when they want a more holistic approach, mm -hmm. they should be able to go in with their oncologist with great confidence yeah. Yeah. that the data is with them. Yeah. So is, because this was a question, is going to war on cancer the right approach? Mm. Sorry, you still have to try to fix it? Oh, oh yeah, sorry, thank, thank you. The producer oh, just corrected me. Thank so. God we're being yeah, kept yeah, on right. track here. That's so right. quick on the finishing right. of the that's lab. Right. So yeah. CRP, we started there. Prognostic, yeah. very important. That by itself, in by itself is very telling in the cancer space. Yeah. And a lot of other chronic conditions, but cancer in particular. The other one is sedimentation rate, also known as the ESR. ESR. And so this little guy rarely run unless you really go asking for it. So it's not a standard, just like when people run a CBC or whatnot, it's not usually part of it. Right. Used to be, used right. to be part of a complete metabolic panel. We'll come back to that in a moment. But that is basically showing how fast the blood cells are settling out of solution. Mm -hmm. So the longer it takes, so the higher that number, the longer it takes for things to fall out of solution, which basically means there's a lot of goo and there for it to fall through. Woo and goo. Woo and goo <laughs> going there. And so these cells, like if it takes a while to get through, they've got a lot of muck to work themselves right. through to get to the bottom, which then shows us there's a lot of inflammatory processes happening, happening in the blood and serum. And so that's one interesting like marker by itself. Again, you go and type in sedimentation rate, ESR and PubMed and cancer and a whole lot of things show oh, up. Yeah. By itself, when it shows up, and the other two trifecta are normalized, I'm usually looking for autoimmune conditions. That seems to be where it tracks the most, right. is with a lot of autoimmunity. So things where the body is, not, is no longer recognizing self and waging war on self. And so that's a good moment to be like, ooh, we gotta be careful with that place because right. it can backfire on you. Right. And then the third one, LDH, lactate sometimes, yep, yeah, sometimes known as LD, lactase, dehydro lactate dehydrogenase, Hilarity, a hilarity here is that we've gotten so far away from running this standard in labs that when I ask a patient to ask their doctor to run this or ask a colleague to ask a, you know, somebody to run it, I will invariably get LDL, which is part of the lipid panel, because doctors don't even know what an LDH is anymore. That's where I thought you were going with that. It and I, I, was, I was hoping that was yeah. not where you were going. And it, it's, it, I cannot even tell you how often that happens. And here, just 15, 20 years ago, when we would do a metabolic panel, it used to contain a, a magnesium, a GGT, which is a marker of, it's a liver enzyme marker and glutathione. This bird is just trying to chat with us too. He's trying to join in the well, podcast. Well, we can take some questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it used to contain a sedimentation rate, right. a uric acid, and an LDH. That's what a comprehensive metabolic panel used to have. Someone behind a desk, an insurance person, scooched that off the plate saying, this isn't important. But I will tell you right now, those five I just rattled off are probably the most important to look at our terrain right there. So if you are in with your oncologist, your doctor, yeah. you've been diagnosed with cancer, remember the trifecta. Yeah. C-reactive protein, 
ESR sedimentation rate and lactate dehydrogenase. Now, if I remember correctly, I think yeah. lactate dehydrogenase, isn't it like elevated in over 70% of cancers? Yeah. Because it's, I mean, it's, yeah. so your title, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer, LDH is... A metabolic marker. Yeah. In fact, my crazy biochemistry husband tells people that if the LDH is on, meaning if the LDH is elevated, the mitochondria are off. Yeah, we were having coffee over that discussion yeah. this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. There you go. And that's the thing. And so here's a marker that is a surrogate marker of exactly how your metabolic mitochondrial pathways are working. And here's another funny thing. So your listeners, if you're an oncologist, if you're a patient, if you are someone with a blood cancer, a hematologic cancer, or a melanoma, which I personally put in the category of hematologic cancers, which will upset a few dermatologists in the mix. Um, but ultimately, things like multiple myeloma, melanoma, mm -hmm. leukemias, lymphomas, the marker, the cancer marker you use for those or should LDH. is an LDH. Yeah. And how many times do you or anybody listening, especially if you have one of these cancer types, have you ever actually had that test run? Well, I, it's very rare. I test on all my patients. Well, you do, but, but I mean, when you see somebody else coming in, that's been seeing a hematologist for oh, their hematological never there. cancer, it's never, never there. there. I'm like, you really, so I'm working with a patient right now who's been to the best of the best, of the best big name institutions all over this country and all over the world. Cause he lives, he lives abroad. He has a Hodgkin, he's got a lymphoma. Yeah. No one has ever in all of his time run an LDH. When I started working with him, everyone told him he was Ned no evidence of disease. His LDH was over 340. Which is abnormal. Very high. Abnormal. My range is under 175. Anything over 175 is a problem for a lab core. Anything over 450 on Quest is a problem. His was over 330 or 340 on a lab core test, which in my book said this man is not only, yeah. he's not only not no evidence of disease, it's aggressive. Yeah. Uh, that was in September. He just had imaging because it was clear in, in September. His images were all clear. Ring the bell. All good. That's right. <laughs> it's everywhere now. Oh, gosh. And, I, and here's what he did. Like, because he thought he was fine. He went back to all the practices that he did before. Like, you can't go back to the soil in which you got sick. So resuming the patterns that, that tainted your terrain, right. the environment that got you sick to begin with, you can't go back there. That's not part of your story. You write a new story. And so the trifecta that my patients coined that name, in fact, it's so hilarious that people will call, I'll get a call from a lab over the years and I'm like, what's this trifecta? <laughs> so my patients are who coined that, not me. You need to patent it. Exactly, we need to patent and <laughs> trademark that. That's right. Um, but it is because now what's even funnier, you could actually go in and type in all three of those, LDH, sed rate, and CRP into PubMed and cancer. Just put those three oh, yeah. in the, it's gonna that correlate. connection so you can even look at any one of them by themselves or a driver, but there's actually studies showing what I'm speaking to. Oh yeah, no, this is data driven. Very, there's very specific of it. me, like finding that on my own before I even knew that there was research that existed. It was like for me to see patterns, observe patterns, hundreds if not thousands if not tens of thousands of patterns over and over to go, wow, I'm seeing trends here. And then suddenly realizing that for me, tumor markers mean very little Imaging means very little. Little the trifecta seems to be my go-to for letting me know when something is on the move. Well, I want to, I want to highlight at least two more questions. So if you have any cool. questions, please throw them at us. Um, the question was because I got a little bit off track. Thank you, producer. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, not not used to the humidity. So, you know, <laughs> Just, that's, that's just kind of, you know, it's... Yeah, it, you it's, live in the desert, my that's friend. Right, that's yep, right, yep. Where, where humidity is an afterthought. <laughs> um, but, you know, should the approach to target cancer be to go to war mm. on cancer? You know, I, I talk mm. about this a lot because when you look at surgery, it was literally born out of, you know, battlefield wounds. Yeah. That, that's really what, you know, yeah. pro propelled it to a mainstream practice. But chemotherapy was mm. born out of war. Mm -hmm. Literally. Nixon declared war yeah. on cancer in 1971. Is that a right approach? You know, I know that I, I, I appreciate that people need to find words and motivation and inspiration to meet whatever challenges they're facing in their life. Right. So I can understand, you know, the time that the concept of the war on cancer came out, it was on the heels of two world wars, the Korean War, the Vietnam War. It was from a place that collectively bonded us as humanity right. that we all understood. And so it was, a, it was, a, it was a, an ethos that we could relate to. And it, it served us well to kind of say, 
we were declaring it and we were going to be victors over it. We were coming from that place, right? But 50 some years later, 52 years later, we haven't moved that very far. We're not winning any wars here. In well, fact, the, the, the narrative the says we are. I know, which is, that's a whole nother topic. But, but that yeah. quote that we talked about okay. earlier clearly Suggest. says we're not. Exactly, exactly. And so that is the way you can look at the data, the numbers, you know, it can show that, hey, we're making some headway. But really, when you, we, we've got several data points. We've got a slide that we show that's like this flat line. This flat line, if anything, worsening, but flat line for sure. Yeah. Like we've either made no difference or it's worse. It's either way, it's not as favorable as we like to play it out to be. Right. So we need to do better. Right. Um, and so in that place, here's me and my experience and the patients I've helped. Because I understand cancer is us. We all have cancer all the time, every single one of us. There's actually no nothing out there to refute what I'm saying. Here's a good documentary, Cancer Is Us. Yeah. Oh, there you go. We'll, go. we'll TM that. We'll get on those. <laughs> but it is. And so when we then wage war, we're waging it on ourselves. And our cells are listening. And they're taking that signal. And so I would like to offer for people, I'm, I'm, let's look at other ways to reframe the message you're telling your body. Mm. To say, I understand you're a messenger. You're an opportunity. You're showing me the way. And so how do I look at you as an ally to guide me versus an enemy to attack? So that, that was incredibly eloquently said. Uh, you're such a great, you're, <laughs> such, you're no, so, no, 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 because it's taken me to the next okay, question. Cool, cool. But you're, you're such a great orator mm. um, and you, you truly have a gift and a calling. And you know, it, it's so great to see people embrace their calling. You know, and and many people don't because of fear mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and ridicule yeah. and negative comments and negative reviews, right? And whatever. So, but you embrace that. Not only you embrace that, but you've accelerated that. Mm. So you talked about. I'll rephrase a little bit. Defenses. Yeah. The immune system. Yeah. This was another question we had from earlier, talking about. I've gone through chemotherapy, full dose chemotherapy. How do I help my immune system? Yeah. How do I support my immune system so that it doesn't come back again? Because they said they were in remission. Yeah. They didn't say what type of cancer. How do I support my immune system to keep that from mm. happening? First of all, I love that you're asking this question. And in, in the book, I have a section that's like the 10 questions you ask your oncologist. Because that's one of the questions you should be asking is how do I support my immune system? But I will tell you in 2017 when this book came out, when I would have that conversation about the immune system, I was literally poo-pooed. They would just dismiss it or actually full on ridicule and tell me I was full of shit. I mean, I don't know if I can say that, but I just did. So apologies. Well, you, you well, you know, here's the, here's the analogy. Well, here's the connection, which is quite funny because they poo-pooed it. They, they told you full of shit and yet where's most of the immune system Exactly. I was oh, it's right the, there in the gut. Uh -huh, surprise! <laughs> you were ahead of your time. <laughs> but this is the crazy thing is we're like saying, here's the problem. And I mean, think about it. Think about doc, um, Dr. Allison, who was ridiculed for what, 20, 30 years of his work on checkpoint inhibitors yeah. and now has a Nobel Prize for it. They completely dismissed him. And yet his work is exactly where we put all of our attention in the cancer field today. And then another Nobel Prize went into like the microbiome studies, all these pieces here. This is the place where everyone is now finally saying, after decades of me saying, and my colleagues saying, and you saying, the immune system plays a role in cancer and everyone telling us, no, it doesn't. You're crazy. You're a charlatan. You're a hack. You're a quack. I, yeah. made, I made quack watchers, so we're good there. That's an honor. It is. Thank you. Yeah. And so my, I should have like a little, I should have like my little like uh, trophy. You've been verified. Okay. <laughs> You've been <laughs> verified. Certifiably. <laughs> um, but that's this place where they're like, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And then suddenly when you could monetize it, hmm. when you could monetize an immune therapy, which is massive today in the field, when you oh, can monetize fecal transplants, when you can monetize the testing that goes into these things and the, the, the research and the grants that go into this, suddenly now they've acted like they've invented the immune system hmm. where we've been talking about this forever. So for the person who asked that question, you're asking the right question. And if you asked the question five years ago, they would have told you there's nothing you can do. They'll probably still tell you there's nothing you can do because they'll say, we probably have a drug for that. So just hold tight and we'll yeah. get you that. But really the question comes to me is, well, you need to look beyond because what else is affecting the immune system? It's not just go and take this 
pill or this potion or this probiotic or this immune tonic. Right. It's about what is keeping the immune system suppressed mm. or overexpressed. And that's this bigger question about what's going, what's, what are you putting into your bucket? You know, what are you putting into your terrain, your environment? And so that has to be evaluated because things like mold, stress, sugar, completely dismantle the immune system. But things like co-infections actually can upregulate it. Um, uh, autoimmune conditions that get kicked up by all those things we just talked about can upregulate it. So you get an overzealous or an underzealous immune system or even one that's schizophrenic and bounces back between the two. What's so cool is that this person with this question, we actually have a new test that came out in the last year and a half, two years maybe, which is a way to actually look at the very specific expressions of your immune system. Talking which about is, the that's the Cyrex lymphocyte yeah, Cyrex, mapping. Yeah, yeah. So Dr. Vijdani, a world-renowned immuno uh, immunologist, has developed a test that you can literally look at the patterns of your immune system and know, you know, it's not just about stimulating natural killer cells because maybe, guess what? When you have too many natural killer cells, you have a major autoimmune problem. Yes, you do. And here it is. Everyone's like, take this thing to raise your NK cells, bup, 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 bup. or T cells. Let's push those. Well, it can backfire. And, and there's a whole lot of different types of T cells. And that's just exactly T regs versus T yeah. like T regs actually grow your can. I mean, so here's this thing. We've got this man who's created a nuanced, you know, come up with like 13 or 15 or whatever pathways of how your immune system can express. So far, we're still learning, right? Right, right. But suddenly you can look at this and go, wow, this person's immune system is behaving this way. So this is the strategy we'd use for this versus this. This is what's so cool is we are moving into a time where data can really enhance the patient experience, the patient outcome in a way that we do not have to guess anymore. My mantra that is trademarked, test, assess, address, don't guess, okay. is very much about this approach of please don't like go in there and just throw things at things willy-nilly, which you and I are in this field, even right. in the complementary, alternative, integrative th places, there's a lot of people doing protocols where they are not basing them on the individual's um, terrain. I call it protocolology. It's a <laughs> study of excellent. protocols. Because yeah. I mean, that's what people yeah. will not deviate from that. Yeah. And it's like, well, that's a starting point. You have to have that. I mean, yeah. Steve, yeah. he was, yeah. he said, you got to have some protocols to start with. Like yeah. some fundamentals. But you need to be able to think. Yes. You need to be able to innovate and recognize yeah. when things aren't going as the protocol says it should, exactly. and you can pivot. Exactly. Exactly. And we have, what's really cool is we have these tools, these tests, these abilities to look and get a better starting point. So you know what your, where your baseline is mm -hmm. before you do apply, maybe a protocol that you've used before that worked well in that situation. And then if it doesn't, then you know, okay, time to pivot, look at something else. What else could be going on? But critical thinking skills is not something that we are celebrating in our culture. On, our on a lot system. of levels. Yeah, oh, exactly. Oh, oh. And so it's, it's, it's like, we have to retrain people on how to think. And that includes the patients. And one of the things you and I are both passionate about is changing the narrative. Yeah. On a, not a, you know, like we've been working on changing the narrative on ourselves right. and our, you know, the people closest to us and in our practices and in our communities, but it's got to go bigger because we're up against a Goliath here. But it's a Goliath worth, worth slaying. Mm. And because, and you said this earlier, servant, mm -hmm. physicians are servants. Yeah. We serve patients. And I think the medical community has lost a little bit of that yeah, perspective. Yeah. But as long as we keep that perspective, I think it doesn't matter how many Goliaths are out there. Here's a great thing. The community yeah. that, that we and others like us have, that's how we can put that little pebble mm. in that slingshot <laughs> yeah. and take it down yeah. and take it down. How are we doing on time? Got five minutes. Okay, awesome. let me get some, let me do just a few more, some new questions. Okay. Mm. Okay. I'm so uh, glad there's people. They're high. Yeah. So <laughs> we, we, and by the way, they, they are the absolute most gracious hosts in the world. Aww. And if you, if you weren't practicing medicine, if you weren't changing oncology, you guys would have a five-star Airbnb. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. I love it. People keep saying, Steve, you need a restaurant. I'm like, that means divorce. So... <laughs> What would be the protocol for large B cell lymphoma? Okay, so Ooh. then we're talking about protocols. Yeah. How about just giving maybe three, mm -hmm. three things that you would consider in evaluation? Sure. And then three things in treatment. Well, first of all, with lymphomas, there's a few patterns that mm -hmm. are pretty common. 
So one of the biggest drivers of lymphomas is glyphosate. Yeah. So you'd want to get your glyphosate levels tested. And that means if you basically eat a Western diet, a processed diet of any kind, if you eat a lot of legumes and grains, right, which is what our medical, our dietary nutritionists tell us to do, that's what sequesters glyphosate. If you live near any big agriculture, all these things, glyphosate is a big one. It really is a a component to this. That's one piece. The other piece of B cells, um, B cell lymphomas is uh, uh, viral in nature. And so very specifically, Epstein-Barr virus. EBV. EBV. And so you want to get tested for your titers. Because if you're not dealing with your glyphosate load, your B-cell lymphoma is not going to go away. If you're not dealing with those Epstein-Barr titers, your B-cell is going to keep recurring. And then the other one is lymphomas and leukemias, which often surprises people, are way more glucose hogs mm-hmm. yeah. than we're led to believe. So if you're, still ha- if you're still metabolically inflexible and your insulin levels are uh, well above 5, I like them under 3, but if they're above 5, you've got a problem. If your A1C is above 5, you've got a problem. If your GKI, which is the glucose ketone index, is above 5, you've got a problem. And if your uric acid is above 5, you've got a problem. Those are all major metabolic drivers. You will be driving the lymphoma train. And so those would be like my first patterns to look for so you then know your targets which then will help guide what protocol is the next best step so what you what you're saying is actually quite intuitive and makes a lot of sense mm-hmm. which is you got to evaluate first yeah protocols driven on no information is mm-hmm. a shot in the dark 100 percent. we have to have a place to start of course mm-hmm. as this data starts to roll in but let's say you know with large b-cell lymphoma yeah. is dietary Choices they are important. Absolutely, you want to make sure you're carbohydrate restricting. Yeah. In that environment, you want to make sure you're getting clean food. Right. Very clean food. That's really important. You want, like, so the glyphosate issue is really concerning. Um, and and there are there are a few like tricks I've learned over the years for certain therapies that work really well for certain cancers. And one of the examples of lymphoma that works beautifully is mistletoe. <laughs> dun dun dun. Well, I tell you, what, yeah. you are a pro. Oh my God. So this, this is her most recent book, Mistletoe and the Emerging Future of Integrative Oncology. So check it out on Amazon. Oh, nice. And uh, if you just search uh, Nasha Winners on Amazon book Mistletoe, you'll, you'll find it. And so I thought mistletoe was just for Christmas. <laughs> or just making out underneath it. Okay. Yeah. That too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and first of all, before I forget, like on this B cell, like you want to get your LDH checked. Yeah. Because that's going to be your marker to know how you're doing with whatever therapy you choose. Critical for lymphomas. Very critical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So huge, huge, huge. So that piece, but yeah, the mistletoe piece. This is the old. This is first of all, it is the most studied integrative oncology uh, protocol on the planet, and it's been used in cancer therapies as an injectable in this particular extract since 1917. So over a hundred years. Over a hundred years, and I saw, funny chemotherapy. I know, as yeah, a younger is not way younger. Yeah, as that old. Mm-mm. And what's so cool is I just saw that Dr. Leblant, 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 Dr. Leblant, yeah. um, Dr. Leblant, Miranda. That's right. There you go. It's she, yes, and so I just saw that she did an amazing. A webinar. article on this. Oh, she did oh, an that's article right, in PR. DNR some yeah, time ago, yeah, or yeah. which Towns Letter, or one of them. I was running across something and I was like pulling up something out mistletoe and I just I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. So that would be a great one to link to this That's for people to have, to have a read because she does a beautiful job do talking know, about it. Do you know where that published? Uh, I feel like it was in DNR. No, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, we'll find out. Yeah. I love it. Okay, we'll get that. We'll get so that good. But yeah. she really goes into the history of it, the legitimacy behind it. Really powerful medicine. We just had a clinical, a phase one clinical trial go yeah. through Hopkins. Right. It's now raising funding because no one else wants to give you the money. So we're all bootstrapping, yeah. raising the funds to get to phase two, which is ridiculous because there's over 2,600 studies globally already showing efficacy and safety. It kind of brings to the studies where they go, but more evidence is needed. Yes, more studies are needed. We're so. doing this at Hopkins to show the safety of it, despite the fact that it's been used since 1917. And in, in the Germany, same form. in Germany, I mean, it, you can't even call it, it, yeah, you can't even alternative. Call it alternative. Mm. It's, it's in is. oncology. We're taking a group of doctors to Germany yeah. in September to go to the hospitals to learn how to do intraperitoneal, intratumoral, intravesicular injections of mistletoe therapy partnered with chemotherapy, radiation, hyperthermia in a hospital. Innovation. 
Exactly. Makes me think of my favorite movie with my wife, which is The Hundred Foot Journey. Oh, it talks yeah. about the food innovation, innovation, yeah. innovation. That's what science is, innovation. Mm -hmm. And and you're at the you're at the tip of the spear for that. Let me see if we've got mm -hmm. any other questions here. Okay, this is an interesting one. Okay. We took a natural approach. What's that? We just hit the hour. Okay. We took a natural approach until it continued to grow and started to and started to impact her cognition. Mm -hmm. Here we are after doing four treatments of um, MTR. MRI in two weeks, we are optimistic that it has shrunk or in complete remission, what to do next. The doctor wants us to do ASCT. We're not sure where to turn to for explore, exploration of alternative options. So the MTR okay. designation, I'm not sure, maximum, yeah. that's Tolerated, not... I mean, I'm not sure what they're, either of those, the acronyms aren't familiar, yeah. um, and maybe I'm just reading them out of context, yeah, but with it. my first question back to the, to your question is, you know, how and why were certain therapies chosen, those alternative therapies chosen, because that's just as dangerous in my mind to just go and say, hey, I read a few things online, I read a few things on in a book and applied them, or heard it from an influencer, or someone who just is a protocol mill, um, as it is to just step into standard of care who puts you on the same exact treatment, whether you're stage one breast cancer or stage four or whatever it is, you still need to know what's going on at the baseline. You have to have metrics in order to decide what was the appropriate, you know, what was going on, what's appropriate timing, dose, duration, and combination. What are your metrics to, to show success or not success? And how do you know when to pivot or stay put? Are you implying pharmacokinetics know, and basic pharmacological I, principles have anything crazy. to do with this? Call me crazy. <laughs> and so that's the place of also today, I find that the, stand, the alternative integrative movement is just as damaging because they're not using the tools to their disposal to help our patients make better clinical decisions and find better tools that fit them, the individual, more, more, you know, effectively. And that's one of the things that I really admire about you. I've gotten to know you a lot, you know, a lot more over the last six months, but, mm -hmm. you know, over the last couple of years since that mistletoe is that you have a drive to not just know the science, but to actually elevate and advance the science. So it's not just enough to say this study, that study, this mm -hmm. study. It's we need to study this. Now let's yeah. study it and then let's publish it. Let's put it out there into the scientific community to debate Yeah, yeah. and then say, okay, yes, you're right. Let's go ahead and evaluate this. Yeah. So it's a true application of science. Yeah. That's, that's what you're really at the tip of the spear of. That's really what you're pioneering in. Mm -hmm. It's just given the label of integrative oncology. Yeah. Yeah. And really it should be applied across the board of all healthcare. Absolutely. Right. And so, I mean, even my husband always says like your book, it's kind of a, it does a disservice when it's called the metabolic approach to cancer, because it really should be the metabolic approach to life or prevention mm -hmm. or health or wellness, or you could add diabetes to that. You could add oh, osteoporosis. Yeah. You could put schizophrenia to that. You could put the, the label is it, it, the diseases that plague us today are metabolic and mitochondrial in nature, meaning that they respond to a metabolic approach, to a metabolic therapeutic intervention. And now the studies that have come out in the last few years shows that there are less than 6.8% of Americans are metabolically healthy, which means wow. they are destined to be a patient of yours or eyes someday. <laughs> I don't want that. We, I want to be obsolete. So are you going to be looking at prevention? I, I don't know how you can't focus on this and not focus on prevention because that I think that's where we really need to be focusing. Exactly. Especially with where this whole conversation started, yeah. which is why we are seeing 40, you know, 30, 40, 50, you know, 50 year olds with stage four cancers out of seemingly nowhere and, and like younger and younger and younger. I mean, just like I said, the, the last month, I mean, just this, young woman with a very aggressive brain tumor, 19 years old, lost her sister two years ago to the same type of brain tumor. It's like, the, these are the types of things that we should not be having these really mm -hmm. sad stories. Yeah. And the, the aggressiveness of it and the, 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 the overwhelm that people are facing when they think they have to make a decision of either standard of care or alternative, what you and I are doing and what we're showing people is what we're talking about is standard of care. 
that these things shouldn't have to be a decision. It should just be a given that you get a proper deep dive workup to better know what your baseline is and your starting point to then better find the right suited timing, dosing, duration combination to apply, retest regularly to see if you're still on the right path and adjust accordingly. That should be standard of care across the board with whatever therapeutic intervention is being offered. And yet it is so far from our reality, unless you have the resources to go out of the system and pay for it by cash, which is what we're actively trying to change, which hopefully we'll get a conversation about this this weekend about you know, kind of the nonprofit space and the uh, communal medical system space, you know, the collaborate collaborations Innovation. and innovations. Wow. Exactly. We got to build a new system. That's right. Well, you know, check out the uh, podcast that uh, podcast with uh, Paul Merrick and Pierre Corey. That's going to launch uh, drop wind tomorrow or hey. has it dropped? Hey, uh, Andres, did it drop that podcast? Okay, uh, Paul Merrick and Pierre Corey. Okay, good. okay, cool. Because Coming. we did ask that question. I asked Very him, cool. "Can we save healthcare as we know it?" Oof. And and so there are answers. I think you need to you need to check out. So check it out over the practicing with Dr. Nathan Goodyear podcast that should probably drop tomorrow or the next day. We're Very just waiting cool. on the final edits there, and that's for the upcoming FLCCC conference. But mm -hmm. that's in uh, uh, February, February second through fourth. But Tomorrow, and then maybe a little bit on Saturday, yeah, because that's, a, that's an interesting yeah. thought. I have the true honor of being the guest of a most gracious host and her husband. And uh, we're going to be, be bringing you some content that I think is going to uh, create some waves as I hear <laughs> some waves in the background. That's right. So thank you for all of you joining this evening. We are going to tap out. She's had a long, busy day uh, working. She does uh, have a job. And uh, she's been very gracious to open up her house and her home and her life to us. And we're going to go out and have a little bit of a dinner. We are. We're going to take them to our favorite little local restaurant from all local quality. They don't think we're crazy the way we eat. So we're going to show you how it's done. Awesome. In Mexico. I look forward to it. I look forward to it. Well, everybody have a blessed and wonderful evening. Thanks, all.